Hello, we're here with Kelly Jones. I, I was going to come up with something clever, but I don't know. I was going <laughs> to say, I was going to say we're jonesing for something, but yes, uh, yes, okay. that's always okay. good. Yeah, yeah. We'll be right back. Okay, we're back, and for and I do have to congratulate Mike. He's looking. Um, I thought of him today when they said the oldest person uh, that's ever been to space was in space, and uh, I thought, oh, that's that's Mike Barron. <laughs> uh, but but no, it was William Shatner. It was William Shatner. <laughs> but I uh, I will um, yeah. I have, Mike, how did you first? I, I don't know if the, if the story is with Dead Man or not, but how did you first meet Kelly? Well, you, you know, before we ever met, I was writing for uh, Action Comics. I think Mike Gold was the editor. Uh, Mike had me doing a lot of stuff. Uh, I think he had me doing a dead shot strip, but they handed me Dead Man, uh, and uh, they didn't know what to do with it because Dead Man had been knocking around for years, and he was kind of presented as a superhero, but he's really not a superhero character. Right. Uh, and I have to say that I was at a party with Paul Levitz once, and Paul said, maybe you should think of Dead Man as a horror character. And so I did. Uh, he's a ghost. He's a wraith. He's a man who's stuck on Earth against his will, who would rather be elsewhere. But he has these powers. He can ha inhabit other uh, people's forms and shapes. So I started working, and I think I worked with a couple of artists before Kelly came on board. And all of a sudden, things started to snowball, and I started to get these ideas. Uh, and uh, I forget whose idea it was to be a graphic novel, uh, but it may have been mine. And I put together a proposal, and I sent it to him, and I said, yeah, let's do this. So I wrote the first graphic novel which was a horror story about unrequited unre love in a graveyard uh, uh, with a lot of eerie overtones. And suddenly Kelly just exploded. I mean, that's when his style appeared for the first time and, mm -hmm. and uh, floored everybody. And uh, he's been on a tear ever since. Yeah, thank you. No, uh, for me, I, uh, uh, I was contacted by Barbara Kiesel, then Barbara Randall. Mm -hmm. And uh, she had said that um, the artist who was slated to do the Action Comics Weekly, which were like these eight-page vignettes, uh, had left or couldn't do it or for whatever reason. And would I do it? She had no idea I had an interest in doing that type of material. And, um, and I was – I had – been under contract at Marvel doing licensed good products and I wanted out and they wouldn't yeah. let me out. Yeah. So rather than be a well-intentioned, thoughtful young artist, I was emotional and just said, I don't care. I'll take another job, even for a company, even though I'm not supposed to, because what I, what I got was everything I was asking for in myself. I wasn't allowed to show my style because there was no horror books other than Swamp Thing. Right. And I didn't know Mike. I didn't know uh, Barbara, the editor. I had been doing some a little bit of inking that she saw. Sam Keith had said he's pretty good at doing that kind of stuff. I would throw it to him. They were doing uh, nice. uh, Manhunter, I think, together. So she called me out of the blue. Uh, I said, sure. She goes, it's a very tight deadline. I got these scripts i had never seen scripts like this before um they were utterly unique they were like drawn with the dialogue yeah 
and I was enchanted from that. I I looked at that and I thought, man, that's that is so good. I, I felt more of a connection to it. The first day, and she told me it was a very tight deadline. The first day, I I I had never spoken to Mike. I didn't know anything about what his ideas were, other than what I read in the script. Right. And they came off as incredibly atmospheric, and completely different. And I knew Dead Man from obviously Neil Adams and Jim Aparo. And everyone I'd seen do it after them was aping them. And it wasn't, even if it was talented, it right. was it was very second, third generation. Yep. So the first day I tried to do that, I didn't know Barbara Kiesel very well. I didn't know her at all. I didn't know Mike at all. And I was very disgruntled with the comic book industry and myself at that time. So I figured this is my swan song on the way out and I'll do this. And I was uh, fully back engaged in college. I was disengaging from the whole thing, but this cast a spell on me. And the first day I tried to draw it straight, I got up in the morning to do the second page and I thought it was dreadful. It had none of the life, none of the stuff I'd read. So I chucked it and I drew what just came to my head. This, as, as Mike says, a wraith, a ghost, or whatever. And I saw him as a very sad character who was given all this interaction with us, but apart from us. So right. I figured it would affect him the way if you were addicted to drugs or alcohol or whatever, it would, it would affect him. I drew it. I got no response from the office. All right. I turn in some, the first book, no response. I get about halfway through the next and I think, well, they're going to fire me any second because I changed him from this very muscular super guy to yeah. this floating twisted ghost. But I got a call and it was not even about the art. It was just, hey, the deadlines are this. This is coming in. Mike's got, working on the third one. You got to really bust a hump on this. And I'm waiting to hear you're fired or whatever. Didn't yeah. hear anything. The call then was a few days later was from Barbara saying some other technical thing. And I said, finally, I couldn't stand it. And I said, so what do you think? And she goes, about what? And I go, what I'm doing. And she says, oh, it's fine. It's actually very good. In fact, I'm sending you a note from Mike Barron. And I, I, okay, that was great. Uh, a couple days later, the next script comes and there's this little note from Mike in a little envelope. And he had his own stamps. So it had a little nexus. Oh, like yeah. I remember. Uh, 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 uh. So all it said, it didn't even say, and I have it somewhere in my whatever. But yeah. all it said was, these pencils are pisser. Now, I didn't know what pisser meant. <laughs> so, so I go, I go to friends of mine. I said, "What does pisser mean?" And I get fifteen different comments. But essentially, most of them said, "Well, it usually means something's good or it's okay." It means so, great. Yeah, I, and I didn't know that. I, I'm living in rural, outside of Sacramento, in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. So I go from there. I think that job's done. It's finished. I finish it and I think it's done. I still have never spoken to Mike. I don't know anything. Yeah. But I get a call from Barbara, who was the editor and was leaving to go to Dark Horse. And she says, Mike's doing a graphic novel. Mike's going to do it through Richard Bruning. Mike and the artist who was to be John Tottleman, but D John Tottleman had health issues. So John Tottleman couldn't do it. And I was virtually unknown. I had done these little, these things, but she went in and she told me, now I'm going to go to Richard Bruning's office. I'm going to sit on his desk. It's going to be one of my last acts. He's going to call you, you act surprised. <laughs> but you're the guy I want to do it. And I said, okay, about 10 minutes later, I get this call from a very tired sounding Richard Bruning and Barbara's there haranguing him. And he says, Hey, do you want to do this? And at that moment, your ego swells. And I said, yeah, only if I get to ink it too, because I never was allowed to ink myself, though I started as an inker at Marvel. Oh yeah. 
And he goes, well, that's no big deal. Sure. If you want to ink it, that makes my job that much easier. I don't know how engaged Richard was in, was right. on editing. So I said, okay, fine. And then the beautiful thing that happened was I got this incredible script from, from Mike. And, and I'm not saying that because he's here. It right. was absolutely not the kind of script you read and you say, oh, I got to do this to it or that to it or change or whatever. Nothing. All I had to do was draw it. And then another beautiful thing was they're going to leave me alone for, you know, it's due in a year. Oh, wow. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. So, so I went, okay. And I wasn't connected to DC. I didn't know anyone. So I didn't have anyone going to bug me. Marvel for, as a stroke from God, I was under contract at Marvel. And so I'm sitting there going, how am I going to tell them, you know, that yeah. I'm under contract, I'm out of there. You know, I could give a damn what they say. This is what yeah. I want to do. Yeah. But Marvel called me and said, oh, we got some bad news. Uh, the entire licensing line has been canceled due to contracts and money and the company's not getting along. Yeah. And uh, so you're out of work, but we'll pay you about half what your contract is just just uh, as a severance fee, basically. Yeah. So. In one fell swoop, I got enough money to live to draw this thing and be left alone. It was the best year of my life in comics. Wow. I just sat and drew. I didn't turn anything into them. I think I drew about 40 pages until finally the assistant editor called and says, are you working on this? <laughs> because we have not seen anything. And Mike was busy doing the Punisher and major books, and he didn't care. So they're all happy. They're just going... Well, when it shows up, it shows up, I guess. But I was alone really crafting this thing. And uh, in those days, no internet, no scans, no faxes, no nothing. You right. sent them the original pages. Yes. All I did was I had about 40 pages. And so I put it all up, made copies of everything. I still have all this stuff. Uh, and I send them copies in. And I about the day I knew they got about halfway through is the second time I took spoke with Richard Bruning and he said, I am, I'm very sorry that I didn't call you earlier, but I've been going through these pages for about three hours, just oohing and on. Right. And I have nothing to tell you, but keep doing this. Oh, he nice. says, I've, I've never seen anything like this. And I said, well, wait till I ink it. It gets really good when I ink it. Cause that's what I am. I'm an inker more than a far more than a penciler. Right. And and my storytelling is more geared towards it. There's a very di different storytelling style from superhero to horror. It, it's literally night and day. Right. And so Mike wrote it with beats. It's almost a jazz thing. It's a music thing with Mike. Mm -hmm. So there'd be these wonderful silent moments. Uh, in film, they call it cinema, where it's just you watching an image, no nothing else, no sound, no dialogue, no nothing. Right. But Mike had written it in such a way that there was a lot going on in these silent moments. And that's what I was looking for all the time was that those, those beats. And when Mike got a hold of me and then Casey Carlson, the assistant editor, they would talk without me saying this stuff, they would say, man, there's these wonderful moments where we're reading. And then there's a beat and a pause and a setup. And it really is affecting. Um, I thought nothing of it. Book comes out. It was a huge hit. Yeah. Much bigger than I thought uh, or I'd ever hoped. I was just glad to do it. Yeah. I was still thinking I'm on my way out. Who? There's no more horror books. There's nothing like this. And uh, it was literally the thing where people, I think it happened to Barry Smith too, where people go, God, you, you went away and you came back and you're totally different. Well, it's not that you're totally different. You finally got the subject matter. Right. And the people and everything lined up because I was drawing that way. One of the reasons I was going to leave Marvel and I was an inker, right? Was they wouldn't let me ink. I would turn in these pencils. They'd come back completely different. Yeah. They'd remove all the lighting. They would in some, and no one and everyone at the worst part of it is they would compliment you. Hey, this is great. And then they change everything and they go, well, what's great about it? Anyone can do it. Yeah. And when I was working with Mike, Mike was on all cylinders. You know, he's he's huge on the Punisher. He's next. All this critical acclaim, commercial acclaim. 
and I was just tagging along. I was on this side little thing, uh, and it went everywhere. I started hearing from other artists, major artists, saying that they went in and made copies of these pages. Wow. Uh, I had a lot of people that I really admired who didn't know me at all getting a hold of me just to say how much, what this school, the best, probably the best thing ever said to me was from Neil Adams. And he had said, you solved the problem of me. <laughs> he said, yeah, yeah. Me. And you came in and did this and it's completely natural. It's actually a great idea. I, I had Alan Moore tell me that I had all these people look at this and say, that is right on. And it's, and it's probably my, my strength in comics is there's great storytellers. I'm not one. There's great technical artists. I'm not one. There's great, oh, just people of incredible talent who do this. And I'm not, I, I don't consider myself in that position, but I am a great idea guy. And yeah. the ideas and the way I do it uh, are so unique that I'm forgiven all my other weaknesses for those ideas that people remember. Yeah. And that catapult a character. And that's that's really what Dead Man gave me because it wasn't just portraying him that way. Mike gave a lot of latitude in this. Yeah. And and a lot of freedom to do it. There was a few things I was doing, and I remember uh, the editors said, "Go more with this or do the you know a few instructions." And I said, "Well, what does Mike say?" And they said, "Well, Mike gave us the a okay that if you can prove it to us, we're allowed to give you more freedom." Nice. And and, and I I appreciated that because a lot of people don't. Oh yeah, you know, they're very particular. So, the fact that Dead Man's still around after all these years, yeah. and still commented on as a high watermark, I, I, when I say it's the best year of my life, it's just that everything came together. It, I can't explain it other than that. When your desire to draw comics is squashed, as it was at Marvel, right. not to marvel being mean or anything it wasn't like a bad story it's just they wouldn't let me out of a box and and i can see myself losing the will to live while i was there so i just said okay so it wasn't squashed i couldn't get in it was squashed i was in and doing well right so it was worse so this <laughs> thing comes and it's not a major dc project it's a keep the copyright project right and but it all fell together terrific editor terrific writer a, a major dude uh and i was given uh in fact it the, the thing that i really liked was uh, you can always tell was when production people get a hold of you and say this is terrific yeah they're just handling stuff all day uh when the when the marketing people went and asked for more budgeting because they felt this was going to sell originally they hoped for 20,000 sales we did about 90 Wow. So, and it was huge. It just came out of left field. And I will always be, I always tell you, people coming along, I can see everything wrong that you're not supposed to do in comics that I did in that. And it all worked. And yeah. it was because you couldn't wait to see what was on the next page. You couldn't wait to see what was going to happen in the next sequence. That's um, the essential question in all literature or all fiction is what happens next. Yeah. And the reader or the viewer has to care or he's not going to turn the page or he's going to turn the television off. Now, the funny thing is that comics are the worst medium for horror. And why do I say that? It's because no matter how awful the picture or how great the reveal, ultimately, it's just a pamphlet you're holding in your hands. I remember reading the Swamp Thing Bernie Wrightson and Len Wein did with the werewolf. And you get to the page where they reveal the werewolf. And it's one of the greatest werewolf drawings of all time. But you're looking at the werewolf and you say, yeah, that's a good werewolf. But I don't really care what happens next because the story has not grabbed me by the throat. I also feel it's a mistake to devote a single page to any one image unless it's a spread of a, of a civilization or, or Times Square, something big that's architectural. Because when you spend a page on one image, the story just stops there. 
Now, I'll have a page with, with two panels, you know, a, a big panel and a little panel at the bottom or a big panel and two little panels at the bottom because the story continues there. And when I, I say that the comics, the worst medium for horror, it's because I don't think they can really scare you the way that a novel or a movie can because they have strengths that a comic doesn't. A novel is when you have a real well-written novel with a seductive narrative voice, it draws you into the scenario completely so that your total attention is on what happens next. And you get resentful if somebody comes in and turns on the light or says, hey, it's dinner time. Uh, now, the thing with movies is they control sound and pacing. And that's very important. Uh, you can do pacing in a comic. You do it with your panels. Uh, like Kelly pointed out, you can add those beats, which make a story more natural. But you can't do it the way a movie does. Uh, and when you watch a movie, a good horror movie, you become acutely aware of just how important sound is to a horror movie. There are a lot of bad horror movies with a lot of bad sound effects. But when you look at a good one, like The Exorcist, when Regan speaks, you know, it just sends a chill down your spine. And of course, they control the lighting and the image. I'll never forget, uh, there's an image in The Howling, which is a very good werewolf movie, where the werewolf is way in the background, hiding in the trees. And suddenly the camera zooms in and you just get a glimpse of the werewolf's eyes. And it's absolutely terrifying because the story that surrounds it is good. And you care about the characters. I would only disagree in one area. I think, and, and Mike did it. He wrote an incredibly atmospheric story and yeah. it got to me. And what he also did was he didn't write a shock horror story, a gory horror story. He wrote a Gothic horror story yeah. and it descended into worse and worse and worse, even though dead man successful, even though the bad thing is stopped, he loses everything. And when you go through that journey, and so what I would say is horror that is a tragedy, which is gothic, is what I got. Uh, he loses Anne Colby, right? He's finally reinvigorated by emotion of love, not, not revenge, not bloodletting, whatever. It's a love story, obviously. Right. But the atmosphere of this thing is so incredibly dread and pervasive, and you just are waiting for something. Mike also did a thing that's fabulous. He, You feel like there's ghosts from the circus there, though you don't see them. Yeah. And then when they start showing themselves, it's, it's, uh, it is horrible. It, 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 then you begin to realize he's not just there to fight a bad thing. He's there to fight for this girl. And he's there to fight for himself. And so at that point, it transcends. So probably it's less of a horror story in that sense of the traditional way you think of it. Right. But but the atmosphere of it. And, he, and that's hard to do. A lot of guys don't spend time on it. Yeah. And a lot of guys don't, don't think of... Uh, I'm very big on uh, not so much a reveal, but a payoff. Yeah. You go, I will spend 15 pages to get to that one panel. It doesn't have to be a big panel, just that one panel that pays off the rest. Now, you have to do that. Right. Um, that's something I learned from Bernie Wrightson uh, with his short work. A lot of his short stories did this, where he would spend several pages to get to one panel. And it would work. But then again, it's probably more that it's like a novel less than a film. Um, and, and at that point, it, I, I will say it became hard for me after that because people would bring stuff to me saying, "Here, oh, you like horror, here's horror. And it was dreadful. Right. It wasn't scary. And I'm not a gore artist. I'm yeah. not good at that. Um, the next thing I got that was close to it was an alien story, which again was uh i think i think what mike also i would say if you have ambiguity in these kind of stories which dead man had and i had right. one in an alien story i did a few years later which had a lot of ambiguity to it it was less the aliens more the people yeah and uh and at that point it didn't it didn't 
uh, bore you, but what it did was it gave you dread. You knew the bad thing was coming. And are they going to make it? Are they going to survive? And so it's up to me to make it pay off in these little segments. Uh, I think a lot of horror doesn't work because, frankly, a lot of people don't know how to draw horror. That doesn't mean it's smart. It's just different. Right. It's not, it's not full page spreads and screaming. And it's not. It's actually a lot of very quiet, uh, very contemplative things. And you support the writer even more. Right. You, you get to the emotion of what he's doing and the characterization. Um, a lot of people get into storytelling where it's A, B, C, and you see a thing. Uh, all arranged. And that is correct. And that's what you do. When horror, it's not. It's images that it create an emotion that reflects the writer that's just enough to get it through to them what it is. Yeah. Um, sometimes you want discordant where it's off kilter so it works that way rather than melodic um and a discordant thing is uh, in fact when i was doing dead man it it struck me that mike would do this thing and then he'd throw in a jar a, a very jarring note and i'm reading it and i don't know where it's going and i've read everything I, I read horror, I have read comic book scripts, everything. It was the first script I had received where I didn't know where it was going. And I couldn't wait to see where it was going. Um, it didn't disappoint. And and at that point, that's a that's uh to this day, even I, when I look at it, am affected by that emotion. And that's you know, and I know Mike is doing Punisher and Nexus and the right. everything. But how he did this, it's like he crafted this thing for long stretches in a garret. And uh, so uh, Mike kind of ruined his own argument. He can write a horror story and it scared the hell out of me. The funny thing is, I'm still doing horror comics. Yeah, you you, you worked on me. And look, when, when they did a uh, large uh, kind of a gallery edition, uh, one of those right. big art books, and the reason they did, they they had the people at Graffiti had said we uh, they'd done a Batman. They said, "Boy, we'd really like to do another something with you, but it's so hard to find the art." And luckily, you had a lot of the Batman art. But and I said, "Well, I have Dead Man," and I said, "I I, I think I have like all of it, uh, other than Stephen King, who loved Dead Man." And I had to go. I I didn't want to sell the art, but I gave him one. I sold him one. <laughs> uh, but he, uh, I said that. Um, I do have Dead Man, if that's interesting to you. Uh, he drove up the next day from L.A. I'm about 400 miles. He drove up overnight. Wow. And sat down in my front room, and he went through it, and he said, I'm taking this with me. It's a book. It was that quick of a decision. Wow. He called me up, and he says, I think this is one of the finest. And he'd done Frank Miller. He'd done all these. He says, I think right. this is one of the finest things I've ever seen. I've never seen it like this. Uh, I love the book. Now, I was the only thing I asked was I had a, a little bit of Les Dorscheid's colors put in it, right? Uh, because Les was every bit as much of it. I don't mean that as some false compliment, right? He made him rather than just a red character, this wonderful red to purple transition, mm. in right? Him. And he didn't color his flesh; he just did a little bits of white, so he looked like a ghost. He was very creepy. I never asked Les for that. Les just did it. Yeah. And Les took the uh, enormous amount of time to transfer him to 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 uh, blue line so he could hand watercolor it um, on the boards themselves. Beautiful yeah. work. So so, yes, it all came together. I was very fortunate in every step of the way that I had a list people with a C list guy who was trying to make his name. Um, but like I said, when they saw it and then it sold immediately like crazy. Because it was one of those, I can't tell you how many artists and writers still to this day get a hold of me over that book. Les uh, is doing years. landscapes now, uh, and they're beautiful. Les yes, they are. Com. Yeah, I'm, I'm talking to him, but I, I'd like to uh, get a few of those paintings. They're gorgeous. He was a genius. He is a genius. Yeah. And uh, uh, he once explained to me when I did Aliens, I was telling him there's something really remarkable about this. I never thought of this before. And he goes, well, 
uh, with Dead Man, I did a lot of outdoor lighting. In Aliens or in Spaceships, I did indoor lighting. Uh, so I really reduced the thing. And it was a huge difference. So when they go outside of the ship, he did a, it was completely different. And I went, right. who thinks like that? That was brilliant. Yeah. No one else I knew would even think like that. Yeah. That's people who care about their craft. Uh, that's getting into the weeds, man. Oh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh. That, that is. And, and here I am thinking I'm some smart dude and I'm not smart. Like I, I'm not a guy who thinks I know the answers. I'm a guy, uh, who's very, in, I, I try to play my intuition yeah. and I, I realize I'm not afraid of my weaknesses. I've actually went with them as well. Then I have to compensate. Um, Mike was working with, I think, I think the great storytelling teller of my period was Steve Root. Um, un unbelievably, you didn't need, you could just follow it. Yeah. And it was energized. I spent the weekend in Phoenix with the dude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's a genius. And so I would look at that and I go, well, I'm not that guy. But on the other hand, the things I try to do are create that image you don't forget. And that can only happen if you're led to it and it's a moment that you should remember anyway. Um, I'm big on ambiguity. Sometimes I don't want it clear. I, I, I purposely don't want someone to know. I want them to slow down yeah. and look at something. Uh, I compose everything not with the... Uh, it all starts with light. Yeah. So the composition has to be based with light and shadow. Everything else is after that. And I use the light to point the way. That's something I learned from Marshall Rogers um, was directing the eye. Uh, he, he could, he actually had more of an ability, but for me, it was with light. Um, and uh, everyone says, oh, you're a dark shadowy artist. I said, I use it to point. The light is what I'm working about. That's right. That's what I'm worried about. Um, and from there I'll go. I, I will break every rule to get that to work. I will break every single conventional idea to get that to work. And that's where style comes from. So people, uh, I don't care if someone says, well, the anatomy is all screwed up here. Well, yeah, I bent it to make this happen. You know, um, I could do it the straight way and it doesn't work. Uh, I do it this way. That's how I got dead man to be what he was. Right. Um, it's how I got Batman's cape to work. Uh, if I, if I worried about the other things, it, it wouldn't be as mysterious. Um, and also it separates you from the pack. It yeah. ultimately, it, you have to, uh, DC had gotten a hold of me about two years ago and said that they had, uh, I don't know how they determine these things, but, uh, but they had said that the Batman I had done was the definitive one of the period of the nineties. And they were doing this licensing thing and they were, and I would go, well, how do you come to that conclusion? And they simply said, because everybody remembers what you did. They would say we, uh, other artists we deal with now, they remember that, uh, other writers, they'd say, well, we want, and they would use, you know, like a Kelly Jones scene or a Kelly Jones, this, and I'd never, you know, I didn't hear that while I was doing it. Right. Um, but I did it that way because everybody else. I don't want to say look the same, but they all had that re very realistic approach. And I figured, well, again, how did it, they were all in the long, long shadow of Neil Adams. Yeah. And uh, I remember Adams telling me that he's, uh, I was actually sitting with Wrightson and he came up and told me he loved how I did Batman because there was no way he would think of it like that. And it, it really worked for him. And I said, well, Neil, it, none of it's realistic. And he says, that's why I like it. <laughs> you know? Uh, so, uh, but then again, it's comes to the old Kubrick line of there's realistic, which is awesome. And then there's interesting, which is a lot better. And so yeah. I'm, I suck at interesting. So I'll go for real, uh, for, or at realistic. So I'll go for interesting. Yeah. My, my son, my son asked me, um, this week, if you were the person who invented, um, Batman's, um, ears being so, so high oh, no that 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 was marshall rogers yeah that was that was the great marshall rogers who could do all of it um yeah 
and and he was a guy that uh uh you know i always hear oh he's underrated no he's not underrated everyone who knows this medium knows him right and and uh he's a guy who only needed six or seven issues of batman and he was it was like that's it uh he didn't need a lot he knew exactly what he was doing uh and i had the very good fortune at 16 years old of him telling me to stick with doing comics. I didn't think I didn't show him my art. A friend of mine took my art and showed it to him. And uh, he took me aside and told me then that if I stuck with it, I would probably do a very interesting Batman. I had no clue idea that I would ever get into comics at that age, but right. he did make me take it a lot more serious. And uh, uh, he was a uh, brilliant guy at taking a story and making each panel count there's no fat in a yeah. in rogers drawn story it's yeah. all essential and uh i i wouldn't have the patience to do that i don't know how he did that but he was uh one of those rare guys who's influenced by will eisner and doesn't look like will eisner yeah 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 I have a, I have a quick question, and it's probably going to be nothing. Although, okay. but since you're since you're since you care about the details, maybe it is. One of the things I noticed when I was looking back through your stuff, getting ready for this, um, compared to a lot of other artists and everything, um, and it, it may be, and this may be, uh, since I spent more time with the dead dead man than anything else, it may have, yeah. it may be mo more different for that. But it seemed like to me that a lot of the panel um, sizes were close to the same size, but they weren't the same size. Like they were slightly off mm -hmm. it, it, to like, in my mind, I was like, I feel like that, I was like, if he was intending to do that, I mm -hmm. feel like he was doing it to be a little unnerving. I, I'll tell you where that you're absolutely right. And you are one of the very few to have caught that. Yeah. I mean, okay. it, I'm telling I, anybody, look at his stuff. Go back and no, look at his stuff. I'm telling I you. I was a enormous fan, a, a worshiper of Shirley Jackson's Hill House. Oh. And in that, she writes this thing about the house itself, that everything's a few inches off. Everything's on an angle. Yeah. Everything that you think is straight isn't. Yeah. Uh, yet it's all there. It's it's actually Baroque. It's overdone, but it's all off. Right. And all of that off leads to a distortion. Yeah. And that's how I I I looked at other people how they would line up panels and they're all this way, and then the big one tells you a big thing. Yeah. I sometimes would take a big panel and not put anything in it and do it in the small panel. Yeah. Or I would offset them just a little bit. Just a little. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And I, I, I still do that. I think dead man is the place. To, I mean, I haven't changed philosophically since dead man. I've changed in how I do things. And right. I have a, my own philosophy is I don't go back and look at my own work. I hadn't looked at dead man in t uh, from when I did it until they wanted to put the book together. And I had to help with that. I didn't right. look at any of my Batman stuff. When they wanted to do the same thing with Batman, I had to open up the art boxes. I hadn't yeah. opened them up in all those years. Um, I don't go back and look because I don't want to repeat myself. Yeah. And I want I want things to have that. I, I, I'm I believe that that there are very structured ways to do things and whatever. But what breaks the mold or breaks the rules that allows for success is emotion. So if I'm very receiving looking at something reading something i go wow i don't say did they do it right or wrong i just wow and yeah. i figure that's how i want to put it to paper um i trust the writers and the editors to keep me in the lane and they will yeah. sometimes say you've gone too far or this is wrong <laughs> or explain it to me why you did this right um and that that i can do but i do i've i've reconciled myself that i'm not gifted like other people. And I reconcile myself that I don't have the talent that they have to do this that way because I didn't grow up saying I want to be a comic book artist. I grew up wanting to be a history professor. 
And, wow. and I loved comic books. I loved film noir and horror films. I loved uh, uh, those kind of things. So when I studied art, I didn't take art classes. I was taking film courses. Yeah. And, and that's why I mentioned Kubrick that I love Stanley Kubrick, but I didn't understand how he did anything. And then I took a film class. I realized they didn't understand what he was doing either, but it was in, it was working. So I just took the time to try to figure it out myself and read about, uh, uh, he said a fabulous thing because I really liked his filming of The Shining and a lot of people didn't at the time. Right. The problem I had with The Shining as a book was the character of Wendy didn't make sense to me. And she had she was such a strong person in the book. Why would she put up with this idiot who, who hurt her son and hurt her? She, uh, I know my wife what she'd do. Right, right, yeah. Okay? And they played her this strong-willed woman. Well, in the movie, you see her arc of this weak woman who outplays her husband, outplays mm -hmm. the house, outplays everyone and saves her son. And you see her become a strong character. And he wrote about it saying, well, I love The Shining. It's a great novel. It made me turn the pages. It was complete pulp. It had no literary merit. Yeah. <laughs> and he said, but what you do is he focused on that character. And I thought that's, there you go. Then the rest takes care of itself. So right. I kind of, I go about it that way. I go about it looking for those kind of things. And and that's why I always like The Shining, the film, better than the book. Because he I saw... say one thing about the book. Uh -oh. He makes a good, a great deal yeah. about what happened in room 223. Yes. yes, yes. And in the original novel, you enter room 223. 223 on page 223. Yeah, it, it would. And I think too that the original editors made a mistake by not putting in the intro explaining kind of the history of the house that they did in later printings, where they right. gave you like this 15 page prologue to the book that really yeah. sets the tone. Uh, the initial editors felt it gave too much away. I think it did the opposite, it, it made it much more eerie. Um, yeah. And, and, uh, so at that point, uh, but I, that's what I got from film and film classes. And so I took a lot of this. Stuff. I remember Neil Gaiman got a hold of me. Uh, I was interpreting his stuff and I wasn't so much changing, but I was, I was changing the beats and getting to it. And he liked it a lot. And he said to me, uh, again, a good observation. He says, I don't think you come from a, a, a graphic background. I think you come from a film background. And I yeah. said, I do. And I said, I just been finished uh, uh, prior to taking on the Sandman books. I had um, done a lot of reading and for my own enjoyment of how James Whale did things and his compositional work and, uh, and how he, uh, was able to take these incredibly eccentric things and present them in a, in a way that people would get it, even though they're highly eccentric with his angles and his lighting and whatnot. And nobody was really doing that the way he was. So I was feeling it then. And I was, I had just read a thing on John Ford on how he would shoot things. So I was using those two things for what he was doing. I wasn't looking at other comics or other artists, not that I don't love them, but They've already solved the problem. Yeah, it's kind of right. my job to figure it out for myself, you know? Yeah, yeah. And then that kind of informs your style. and. Well, it's how you keep a style. Yeah. It's, and and look, in the 90s, there came down memos saying, we want everyone to draw more like image or more like a West Coast style, they called it. Yeah. I didn't do it. And the long and the short of it is my stuff lasted. And stood the test of time and is not dated. Right. And it's because I stuck to that. And I saw a lot of other guys change. They were doing it because they were told, you know, this is how you make a living. You gotta, you gotta do it. I always, I always have one foot out the door anyway. I always figure, well, this job they'll fire me. This one's enough. Or, <laughs> you know, this this they aren't gonna go for this. Um, so I always keep one foot out the door. And yeah. uh and my family were all self-employed people, so I was never afraid of that. I mean, you right. find a way, you know? Yeah. Um, I don't need, I do not need the industry. 
and the industry certainly doesn't need me. So I'll just keep doing what I do. And well, I got to disagree with you there. I think the industry <laughs> needs you a lot more than you. Well, need the industry. I, okay. I appreciate that. And, and I will <laughs> say, I will say that as time has went on, I'll hear things that I never heard before. I would work with people. We would do our jobs. You move on to the next. But as time has went, I'm hearing from people saying, hey, I, I, this is something I had fun with. I haven't had fun in a long time. If they're coloring my work, lettering my work, right. working with me as a writer, they're having a lot of fun because I do this thing that is normal for me and was normal for the writers I worked with. Mike was accustomed to it. Doug Minch was accustomed to it. Gaiman, all of these guys were accustomed to that. They were used to it. People came in. Uh, when I grew up, you knew a Marvel book or a DC book. You could, you knew who was doing it just looking at the cover or looking at the art. You didn't have to read the credits. Right. You knew who they were. Now I don't know. And I don't say that as the old man like this. There's a homogenization that has yeah. happened. And uh, uh, a homogenization, like colors come to me and they are puzzled. Yeah. And what happens is it takes them a little time and then they start going, I'm having fun. And I've, I can't tell you how many of these guys have said that. And they just come out of nowhere and they say, I just want you to know if you are doing something else, I want to do this because this is a lot of fun. I get to do a lot of different things. And, uh, and I always tell them less is more. No, don't overproduce me, underproduce me. Just pick your palette and do it. You don't have to do flares and you don't have to do bright. And you don't have to do shit. That's true about scripting as well. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is. And just let less is more with me. I'll do the lighting. Realize color, the, the black is a color, and it's okay. Just let it be. Don't don't knock it out. Don't overdo it. And when these things come out, it, and I tell them what you want, uh, especially if you're in an anthology or if you're in, in, a, in where other stories, you want to stand out. Right. You know, and you can be with great people, absolutely brilliant people. But I always felt that uh, as I did when I first with, with the one thing I knew when I did Dead Man with Mike was nobody else was doing this. Yeah, I knew that good or bad. Nobody was doing this. Good Let's or talk bad. a little bit about the industry today. Okay. <laughs> uh oh. I mean, we both get the impression that Marvel and DC are circling the drain. They're not bringing in new readers, uh, and it's no puzzle to yeah. figure out why. Uh, yeah. As as I've been saying all my life, the writer or the artist's first job is to entertain. That's why people buy comics because they want to be entertained. They want to lose themselves in an enthralling story. They want to root for the for the good guy, and hiss at the bad guy. And I think that uh, major comics have lost sight of that. Do you know. think, Mike? Do you think that they see that the people making these decisions see that as old fashioned? Do you think they see that as as a naive way to look at our quote on modern world? I agree with what you're saying. I'm just I don't saying think they think about it. No, I think they come in with an agenda which has nothing to do with entertainment. Doug, Doug Mitch had once told me some years ago. He said, "What, what we're trading in, what our business is, is imagination." Yep. And you count on your imagination, not one idea that we stretch out over twelve issues, not not some kind of event. Uh, he never worried if if he did something and they yanked it and he had to go on. To some, he'll come up with something else. Uh, he was a big proponent of if you're going to get people into comics and I totally, I get it now. Uh, when I worked with him on Batman, he made a point to do one shots or two part stories that were not connected to anything. So a fan could hand it to another one who might not be into it and say, here, give it a shot. Great idea. And and he also said it forced the creators to stay closer and truer to the character. Absolutely. Because if you're going to do a one-shot Batman, you got to know and keep it to Batman. Yeah, I love one-shot stories. I've yep. done so many of them with both with my own characters, Nexus and Badger. Yes. Uh, because my whole thing is, is, is how do you get the reader to care? Well, you have to make every part of the story entertaining. 
yeah. you can't uh, coast over. Well, there's a few no pages. cheating. I, I think I think there's no cheating. When I first started at Marvel, they had a great clipped way of teaching a young artist who knew. Because uh, I told them I don't know how to draw a comic book page. When they put me on Micronauts, I only knew how to ink. The artist leaves. I think I'm going to either ink the next guy or I'm off. And they said, no, we want you to pencil. And they had a great shorthand way of doing it. They said, when you get a page uh, to draw, read the script, pick the panel that turns you on the most and kick ass in it. Make it awesome. Then get the others done. Right. And do this every page because one, you're going to try to make a deadline. And two, we're trying to sell the art. He says, they, uh, Ralph Macchio told me, he says, and if you do this on 22 pages, that's 22 really great panels. Now, you won't be able to do that. He said, there's no way. Regular art is very hard to do that if you're keeping a monthly deadline. Not years to do it, a monthly deadline. But if you can do that and get that preponderance of, 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 of panels, really great panels, it will influence you on a, it will help the other panels too. You'll you will do better, but you you focus on that. And what it did for me was it made me think in those terms of making it exciting. Uh thinking, how do I do this in an interesting way? And make your deadline. I think a lot of the weakness in comics now, Mike. Is there given guy? Uh, no one has a long run. I did three years on Batman, which is, they all go, how did you do that? Well, it wasn't a magic trick. Everybody else was doing it. You just work. Well, and also you have to have a writer who tells compelling stories and knows how to do that issue after issue. Well, you work with them and you but, say, what do you want to do? They would say, what do you want to do? I want to do Mr. Freeze. I got a Mr. Freeze. He wanted to do a, uh, uh, something with, with the uh, Swamp Thing. We did Swamp Thing, but you know what's coming, right? But what happens is you have people now who are spending an enormous amount of time on stuff that doesn't matter, Mike. I don't care how many laces are in Batman's boot. I could give a crap. Um, yeah, uh, okay, first. so they're spending all day on this stuff. Like, how would it be in the real world? And I go, I don't care how it was in the real world. I can go to the movies and see that. Um yeah. It's like I live in the real world. Why yeah, <laughs> uh, the, the the Kirby wasn't in the real world, and he and Ditko wasn't in the real world. They, but Jack didn't spend all day doing little laces. He did a boot jack and off to the next thing. So at that point, I I still have that kind of shorthand. I put a lot of effort in my work, but I I pick my spots on where you do it, and and I and that's when I see these artists. And they can only do two or three issues a year. And I go, you, first, you can't make a living. But secondly, you can't sell a character to a fan base that doesn't have a month in, month out team. A, a, a team that's doing it. Not for a few issues, not for a mini series. I mean, I had to sign a deal with DC that I was going to do it 12 issues. And the part of the subs the bottom part was they wanted me for three years so i had to sign a thing that yeah i would I, I would not walk i would do it for the three years and that's because they wanted something to come out they they had it going on with uh dixon and nolan uh they had it going on with brave fogel and grant so that's you it wasn't just the character in the event they were selling the teams not you're super hot and we're going to do it now. They needed, they would take care of the selling the book. But they also, for the health of the industry and the books and the company, that's what you do. And then people have something they can rely on. The, um, the most important thing is to tell a compelling story. Yes, it is. So, well, how do you do that? You use every tool at your disposal. You take a fascinating character like Batman, who is inherently interesting. You have you throw him into a situation that is inherently interesting. I always use uh, Jurassic Park as an example. What if they could clone dinosaurs from ancient cells and make an amusement park out of that? That yeah. in itself is interesting. It's going to grab all the kids who were ever in love with dinosaurs. Yep. Or you can have a seductive narrative voice. Yep. There's so many ways to do it. And you use anything and everything 
to keep the reader turning the page and wondering what happens next. I absolutely. And, and for me, when, when I'm either reading something or watching something, uh, it is, it's what's going to happen next. And, and I'll tell you what, Mike, I can even know what's going to happen next and it won't hurt it if I'm enjoying the ride. That's right. Right. There are okay. certain things you know, expect. Right. If I know what's going to happen or I go, okay, I know what's going to happen. I don't care. If I'm digging it, I'm fine with it. I know in my Western, the good guy's going to have a drawdown with the bad guy. Yeah. I know that's going to happen. Uh, I'm fine with that. But the way you do it, if you're watching a, you know, a spaghetti Western with Clint Eastwood is what a ride is that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then you throw in something interesting like the a complexity to a character that you didn't that that, that you slow down and, and and give some kind of complexity to a character. Did you see nobody? No, Stone? I haven't seen I have uh, not seen it. I want I want to. It's it's it starts out great. I'm not gonna go into it, but it has a Russian oligarch, as so many movies do. Well, and, yeah. And at one point the oligarch enters his own nightclub. And he goes up on stage and he starts singing and he's, he's so entertaining at it. And he's just the most vile, evil guy you'll ever yeah. meet in your life. But right away, it gives him a new dimension. Yes, it does. Amount of sympathy. So you stick with it. Yeah. I rem And speaking to that point, like I was saying, uh, in The Good, The Bad and The Ugly, you have Eli Wallach's character, Tuco, who is what he is. And then when he finds, when he runs into his brother, who is a Catholic priest and his brother upbraids him. In the back and forth, you realize Tuco was screwed over by everybody, and he tried to do the right thing, and he, he did everything he could until and they and supported them all. They all go off, and then they criticize him. They all have their lives based on what he did, and you realize you feel uh, you go from this a moral character to where you feel really bad for him. Mm -hmm. and you see how he got there at the whole time, unbeknownst to Tuco. Uh, Blondie's listening to it. Clint Eastwood's hearing it all. And it changes Clint Eastwood as it does the audience in his dealing with Tuco. And that, you didn't even need that in the movie. It's great on its own. They throw that in there and it changes the whole tone. That's genius. And the, I never see that anymore. I mean, it's like, why did they do that? I don't know. It worked. It's awesome. It's great, great. Like, like Mike said, it turned it up a notch and then you really made every scene after that interesting and it made you reflect back on what happened that's great writing yeah yeah um what was i gonna say well i, I got a couple of announcements uh -oh. we're gonna launch thin blue line next week on thursday thin blue line is a graphic novel about two police officers trying to hold it together during the night in a riot torn city it's ripped from the headlines there is no preaching it's all drama it will grab you by the throat on the first page my penciler is a full-time police artist i mean police officer <laughs> and he still managed to finish the book faster than many pros ah, that's good no i have uh i did a story for jeff john's geiger uh, image oh cool that, that should be coming out here pretty quick um and I have a massive, gigantic project you, that he can't say anything about. <laughs> I, it's with all I can say is it's with Matt Wagner. Oh, it's cool. enormous, uh, and I've been working on it for some time. Um, but it's right now uh, in the getting ready for announcement stage. I've done my end of it. They're now doing their their part. <laughs> And uh, yes, I would love to say what it is, but it's uh, everything that I love. It's vile and horrible and no ennobling. And uh, it's, it's everything in a pot that, it, you know, and it's, I would describe it as uh, literary pulp. <laughs> you know, you just, it's like Mike says, you turn the page, you just, what's gonna happen next? Um, there's a great thing that I, I kind of tell anyone I work with now. I don't care what they write. I just want them to, um, what I, what I want them to do is that there's a great, again, I'm, I keep 
mentioning him. There's a great thing by Stanley Kubrick. And he said, how do you make a movie, right? How do you sit down and write, it, it, put together a film? And he said, he goes with whoever he's working with, a writer, whatever. And he says, here's the story. Here's the idea uh, or what I want to accomplish. And what we have to do is think of seven or eight great scenes. I don't care how they connect. We'll stitch them together later. But we just think of these great scenes that people, wow, and you never forget. That's and then true. We, yeah, and then we figure out how to stick it together, and that's your movie. And it's you know, I, I had a teacher in college, uh, and he said, you make them laugh a little bit, you make them cry a little bit, you scare the hell out of them, and that's entertainment. Right, and, and I think what also I liked was he would leave things open to the moment of inspiration. Uh, he would leave something organic would happen out of this. Yep. And that way you're not locked in and you go, hey, there's this thing we can do. Let's add it in, move this thing out or combine them or whatever. So when, I, when I'm drawing a book or whatever I'm doing a book, that's what I do. I did, uh, recently I did for DC Batman Kings of Fear and that's, that book did extremely well. And it was really, that's how it was put together was we would think of several neat things we wanted to see. Then we figured out where they would happen in the books. And then when the books came, we plotted them that way where it would be several great, interesting scenes. And all I did was take it from, I simply swiped it from Kubrick because I didn't want to do what everyone's doing with Batman, this frankly boring Batman. I was it just, it's boring. I wanted mine to be the way he was, the way he is, and the influence on his environment and the influence of the environment on him and, and not get into all this other stuff. Uh, and the fact that it did as well as it did, I actually, I, I was very lucky. I had two things back to back that almost seem um, uh, bizarre to me at this point that they did as well. It was uh swamp thing with Len Wein, whose main thing was fun he would always say these have to be fun and when we're making them we have to be having fun every time i would finish a conversation with him well then i gotta go he'd say kelly remember we're having <laughs> fun this is supposed to be fun and finally i said why do you keep saying that lenny says because nobody's having fun <laughs> he said so so uh it can seem odd that these things that uh, look, you go to James Bond, you want shaken and not stirred. Right. There's tropes you have to do, but how you do them, that's the interesting part. Right. How do you do that? How do you do it where it's where it's new or it's fresh or it's different or it's or it's comforting? Yeah. Um, and you remove those things, you lose it. And I think a lot of what I see in comics is, uh, like I said, a shame of the characters or a shame of the, of the way we do it. Um, uh, uh, we're, we're embarrassed that comics are bing, bang, boom and all that kind of stuff. When, when it's that very aspect that made them this huge, at least for now, uh, pop culture phenomenon. Yeah. Um, once they start Hollywoodizing the books or Hollywoodizing the movies, they're, they go away. It goes yeah. away because everything we're doing is eccentric. Mike is highly eccentric. I'm highly eccentric. Most of the people I know who do this are highly eccentric. And that eccentricity weaves itself in because Mike only has to deal with the typewriter. I only have to deal with the drawing board. There's not a committee. Right. And we sink or swim. And uh, you go from there. And what happens is Mike's clearly entertaining himself. I'm clearly entertaining myself. And that kind of uniqueness, and we're all by ourselves. You read it by yourself. I'm making it by myself. We're all by ourselves. It's not a communal thing. Right. Not, you know. So we've, we've been preparing for this pandemic our whole lives. Yes. I had no <laughs> When they said you have to stay in your house and never worry about it, I was, <laughs> I didn't see any difference, you know? That's right. Uh, but but it's it's the thing that they have the hardest time for. I've recently had some trouble 
uh, because they, the, the whole idea was they didn't understand eccentricity. Yeah. And they didn't understand that if you do this in an ABC way, you can have a, that that's fine if that's all they get. But if you do a M and B C, <laughs> you know, sometimes something cool comes out of that. Yeah. And, and it will spin off into other things. And I would have these, discussions ultimately i would always lose because i was the only guy spoke it with people who didn't understand it they were all they had no history the the frustrating thing would happen is about a month after that i would lose these arguments uh they'd call me up and go you know what you're right you were right that should have happened this way i thought that would buy me the next argument right right never, yeah never did the next argument you lose i'm okay with losing I'm fine with that. What I'm not okay with is not learning. <laughs> you know, we're just yeah. not doing this. Uh, and at that point, something that 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 people say is good, I I don't think is good because I knew it could have been great. Right. You know, and I know that that it could have been memorable. And. I tried to say, you try to say it not in a way where you're saying, hey, I had this success. Let me show you why it worked. What you try to do is say uh, in a gentle way, not your experience, because they don't want to hear experience. And they don't want to hear success. They don't want to hear any of that. We're, they're in the moment. They're in the present. Uh, I had to be honest. I was stunned at, at, at sometimes being told, they don't want to know. Don't right. don't don't bother them with the history of a character, the history of some fact. That's troubling, and I don't know what you do with that. You know, um, I, you want to tell them. Well, fundamentally, that's why you're in your chair. Is this character did these things that you don't want to know about? You know, right. that's, that's why you're making a living. But yeah. that's what happens. Yeah. And. Uh, Look, I uh, I have no problem with it. Nobody gave me anything, so they can't take anything away. I'm just going to keep doing what I do, and it will. It, right now, it's very successful because one fundamentally, I was told many years ago, be yourself. So there's only you. So if you leave something, they'll miss you. Right. Uh, and. So I wasn't affected by this homogenization. On the other hand, at, at the same time, uh, I don't have to participate if it's something stupid <laughs> or if it's something that doesn't make sense. So yeah. I'll just do it my own. I'll still just keep doing it my own way and let that be what it is. I do know that uh, uh, I'm in competition, but it's always been with myself and if i'm competing with anything it's not my era now it never has been when i started doing dead man with mike i was competing with 1972 people right uh the comics then the stuff they were doing then that's who i was competing with would would dead man be better or worse with mike plug or would it be better or worse with gene colon and that's what i was thinking so I had to compete with those guys. I wasn't competing with my contemporaries. Right. Um, I still don't. Uh, I look at those guys still and go, damn, how did they do that? Well, they didn't get overloaded with reference. And yeah. they trusted their imagination. And like Mike says, they kept it interesting and page turning. Yeah. I, I would say the closest, in my opinion, I'm, and I'm sure there's, there's others... Um, I think I'm even thinking of them now as I'm, I'm thinking of like uh, a Simon Bisley or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but but uh, but I'd say like um, the closest things to your style, I would say, are like Sam Keith. Yep. And Mike McNola. Oh, yeah. Well, but you I, guys are all yeah. you guys were all distinct. I yeah. Mean, we I, can tell you. I, I went uh, I didn't go to the same high school, but I was uh Sam and I, Sam Keith and I have known each other since we were 16. He, I knew his cousin uh, who I went to school with and we met and went from there. Uh, and we had the same interest in things. He was more underground. He knew a lot of underground guys and I was more into B-level Marvel comics. So, but we used to sit in my 
kitchen in a house I lived many years ago. And he would do his stuff and I would do, well, we would trade back and forth and we would try to figure out all kinds of stuff. Um, and, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to, now it's hard to find people who know, I mean, um, there's a school of thought like that. I always figured I came from a more EC school, Wally Wood and right. um, uh, Jack Davis and and uh, all those guys, because that's what I used to look at as as like top tier. And then Marvel came along and like did, you know, fuzzy guitars. And and so I added, a, a, you know, Michael, like I said, a Michael Plug or something, uh, Bernie Wrightson. I... Uh, I liked what I saw that way. And it does influence you. It does influence you in your approach too, not just the stories you take, but, but how you do. Uh, when I took Batman, it was written as a film noir crime busting guy. And I right. added the horror elements because I didn't want to look like everyone else. It was as simple as that. Um, That's a lot to digest boys. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, no, I, I've, I've always felt that, the very best part of the medium we do is it doesn't have sound. It doesn't have an, it doesn't have a big audience. You're in there. Uh, it, it is a very intimate thing. Yeah. Uh, it, it's impact is very, if you can do this well is incredibly strong enough to where you become such a fan that in my day, you took a lot of slings and arrows for still reading comics. Right. Uh, whether it's from your peers at school, friends, whatever. For me, it was in an art class, one of the few I ever took. And I was told that they were not garbage, but they were the lowest form of art ever. So I went in there with rights and material showing Frankenstein. And at that time, Frank Miller's uh, Daredevil. And I said, no one I know... It, like like baseball player, there's what, maybe three or 400 guys who can do it professionally. I said, in the art world, there's only a, maybe half that who can do it. And of that, maybe 20 guys who can do it at this level. Yeah. So it's easier for me to go paint or do whatever you're saying than you can do this. Yeah. And, uh, and I knew I would never, you know... It, if I was to say now, it's all because these guys were very artistic. They were very eccentric. They were very much affected by their artistic sensibilities rather than their commercial sensibility. Um, yeah. So, uh, and and I think with comic book writers, um, I'm not surprised comics do well in films. I, rem I remember Alfred Bester, who wrote tremendous novels, uh, science fiction novels, um, and uh, Stars My Destination, uh, The Demolished Man, just terrific short stories as well. And he learned, he said, how to write really well because he wrote comic books in the 40s. And they sat down and said, make it brief, make it interesting, make them want to buy the next issue and keep your plots like this. So when he gave this interview on why his novels were so good, it was because I wrote The Green Lantern or I wrote uh, Black Hawk or whatever he was doing. And he said he still used it. He said the best training ground was comic books. Yeah. It wasn't and and Ray Bradbury who said there's nothing they can teach you that can beat that eight year old kid in you that it can't wait to read something. So he stuck with the eight year old kid, not whatever you know English department there was. Um, right. And both those guys were packed with imagination. I mean, if, if there's a thing they have in common, they're very different. One is very cynical. One's very optimistic and nostalgic. But man, every every chapter is something filled with completely brand new ideas. Uh, and that's what I try to do is take a thing and break it down and make it fun for myself. The biggest fear I have creatively is being bored. Yeah. And if I'm bored, the reader's going to be bored. Yep. You know, um, I try to always tell a writer, don't have one good idea that we stretch, have a great idea every two pages, <laughs> you know, tell, make it interesting. Every two pages, something and not people talking and modes of alienation doing something. 
Yeah. Um, I know it's getting long and it's getting close to Mike's bedtime. Um, <laughs> is there, is there, is there, I, I tease Mike, but I do love him. Um, is there a preferred way for people to follow you on, uh, on social media? To... Uh, pretty much Facebook. I I, I'm not a Twitter guy. I, that Twitter's a weird world. Yeah. Um, I don't do Instagram because it, you really can't explain. Facebook, at least they can go back and forth and answer questions. Right. Um, I don't really do a lot of it only because it eats up all my time. But oh, yes, yeah. you can't follow me. I do always say what's going on. I do keep up. I mean, uh, the thing with Matt Wagner that's coming up, obviously there'll be a lot to do with that. Yeah. Um, and I'll answer a lot of questions at that point. I'm not into the sea. If it were up to me, I'd say what it is now, but right. Yeah. Super, I don't give a damn about secrets and reveals, but, you know, <laughs> but unfortunately I, that one I'm outvoted on too. So if it were up to me, yes, I would say, and it'd be done. I don't like that. Uh, because I think that gets people excited and interested. Oh, yeah. Um, but if they want to going to follow me, that's where to follow. Okay, so follow him on Facebook. Yes, that's what I, I, I'm trying to. Like, that's one of the things I want to try to do as we talk to uh, various pros and different people. Is I kind of want to ask them, like, where's your preferred place <laughs> that you want people to follow? Because we all have things everywhere, but we're not necessarily like. Well, I, I'm, I'm 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 fairly different than most. I only yeah. draw, I only draw in my studio. I don't draw outside of it at all. Yeah, I don't I don't draw in the world. I yeah. only do it on my board in my studio. The rest of the house is a house. Um, yeah. when I'm out in the world, 99.9% .9 of the people I interact with as friends or whatever, don't read them. Don't do it. Don't understand it. It's clueless to them. Um, uh, I'm probably ill served by this attitude. <laughs> uh, but I get, you know what it is. I want to go in there and be charged when I do it. And so I do. That's probably why I do social media in just one place. I wish there was something other than Facebook. To be honest yeah. with you. Yeah. I think oh, it's very yeah. limiting. I think it's fairly dull, and I think it's an old yeah. people's thing. I think it's on its way out anyway. Yeah. So hopefully something new will come along. Um, but uh, as much as I can give to people, that's where I do it because the rest of the time, I think I'm fairly boring. So that's why I keep it low. <laughs> I'm not boring. <laughs> I have a column on Substack. I'm yeah. doing a lot of experimental writing there. MikeBaron.substack.com. Please take oh. a look. Yes. Yeah. 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 And remember, uh, we will say goodbye now. And remember, the word of the day is eccentric. Eccentric. I got